Greetings to our podcast audience. How's everybody doing? I also say greetings, greetings. to our podcast and salutations. There you go. That's okay. what that's what, Jay, that's what Jason used to say. I did. He did. He I'm, dropped the salutations. I'm trying to be less formal. I'm, I'm trying to relax a little. Hey! <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey! hey. I, I could do the, the Rootville introduction. Go. I could say, how y'all's doing? There you go. We so, we so glad, we like so glad y'all come over here. Yeah. See, I, like I got it in me, dude. I could do the Mississippi one. What y'all doing in here? That's right. <laughs> Why'd you come to Mississippi, that's a, that's boy? Very suspicious. <laughs> Everybody, well, it's, every, everyone's if suspicious I don't in recognize Mississippi. You in Mississippi, you probably should not come here. You ain't <laughs> from around here. You ain't from around here. Where are you from? Oh, you down there near Jackson. What you doing up here? <laughs> these these jokes are really killing for the Oklahoma Mississippi oh, yeah. crowd. Yeah. <laughs> Man, Mississippi's ornery. Okay. Huh? Well, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, all right, so we're so we're having a good time already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Taking out all our Mississippi and, and, I think, and I think I know why. It's because uh, we don't have Joel with us today. Oh, oh. no, we miss Joel. We do. We miss I'm, Joel. I'm just I, you know who's not watching? Joel. Joel's, Joel's not. Watching. He don't know. <laughs> Joel Joel. He'll not never watching. hear this. And also because Joel's not here, his mom is not watching. His mom's not True. watching. So we got <laughs> two podcast that's right. audience but right there. Bill is here. Bill might pick up a Kaufman or two watching. Maybe. Nope. No, nope, that's not going <laughs> to happen <laughs> either. It's also not going to happen. <laughs> so, but yeah, we do miss Joel and hope he returns to us very soon. All right. So, let's jump right on into the topic for right. today. We're going to we're going to jump right on in talking about the sermon. This do it. Uh, this sermon series must be pretty rough. We we've, we've stopped almost all the preamble. We just getting <laughs> right into it. Let's talk about that. Well, it's cuz nobody's sending us questions. That's no, true. You I need think to send us some questions. We want to have given up If you're tired us. of hearing us talk about this, yes. <laughs> send, send us, us some else. We'll yeah. talk about it. Yes. So if and if you have forgotten, there's a link in the description, so you can just yep. click that and send us a question. We pretty much answer everything that gets sent to us yeah. within reason. Within reason, sure, so, sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you're reasonable, <laughs> which we all are, we, we are. have a we have a really low threshold That's for right. reasonable. I mean, so <laughs> don't worry right. about just it. Just look at us, you know. Okay, you can even call us names, and if your question makes sense, we'll probably we'll answer it. Probably we'll will. Follow it. Yeah, because that wouldn't be the first time. No. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, on Sunday, Ed, you talked to us about being fearless in examining ourselves and mm-hmm. that whole idea of taking a fearless moral inventory. So, I, I took that word because I think, and I think you guys would agree, it, to me it seems like this addiction to outrage that we're talking about in the series stems from a lot of fear sure. that a lot of people have. So let's talk about what do you think the role of fear, what is, how is fear playing in, in Christians' hearts and minds these days in this age of outrage? What role is that playing in us? I, I'll say in the outrage part, I think, and maybe this is always true, I don't think it's been, I think this is different. Last week you asked, have we always put faith in front of politics? Mm-hmm. I think that's a natural, yeah. unfortunate part. I think our outrage level has gone up because our ability to interact with each other in a non-personal way has gone up. Ah, uh, I can I because can, of because of digital because of digital interaction. Yeah. I can send you emails mm. or I can send you uh, I can I can do a social media post that I know is directed at you. Oh yeah, and you probably know is directed at you, and but other people won't, and I'll have some people behind me mm-hmm. and some people against <laughs> me, but I can be really really because. And then when you confront me on it, I can go, well, I wasn't ta- – did you mm. see me talk to you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they hide behind – they, we, we tend to hide right. behind these kind of things. Yeah. And I just had an interaction with a, a good friend of mine who, uh, after the first week, doesn't come to our church anymore but asked if he could meet with me. And uh, we sat and talked about this very topic and how to respond. And then yesterday he texted me and said, hey, this just got posted in my social media mm. feed from somebody he cares about. How should I respond? Hmm. And I didn't have time. It took me about three or four hours to actually get to his because stuff we were doing here. And I said to him, honestly, that's the kind of post that I would just say to myself, there is no good I can do on yeah. that post. Sure. There is nothing I can do publicly. If we were sitting face to face, one, they wouldn't have said it that way. That's right. And anything I do publicly won't get taken right. And he texted back to me and he said, I said, I'm sorry I'm not helpful. And he said, 
I, it was helpful. I honestly forget that I don't have to engage. Man. He said it was a good yeah. reminder. And so here's what I mean in this age of outrage. The fear part is uh, for followers of Christ, we see something that's opposed to us, whatever it is, mm-hmm. and we're afraid that everybody's going to believe that, and I have the right view, and fear makes me say, I have to say something about that so people yep. know that that is mm-hmm. wrong. Yep. And the truth is we're not gaining much ground doing it. But it is fear that makes me post against stuff or strike out to people instead of going to people one-on-one and going, hey, man, I saw what you posted. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Mm. Wow. I think. I, I, I think you're right. I mean, and, and it gets to the point where, and I've, I think this part of, there's, this is in me too, so it's not a they statement either, but we get, we get to that place where we're so, like you said, we're so afraid that everybody's going to believe something that we believe is wrong that we make it almost a noble I have to do this because if if I don't God's going to lose yep God will lose God's side is going to lose and it and frankly it puts us on a almost a war footing it puts us in a place where we're we're battling and and I don't want to pull off of that too much because I know the Bible does talk about we do fight against principalities right. and ideas but when we do that with people and I think that's where it crosses the line. It's like, I've got to fight that person and, and get th- beat them down or get their opinion to shut down or else God's going to lose somehow. Yeah. And I'm the, I'm the soldier, I'm the warrior that's got to fight for God or else poor old God's going to be over here, you know, getting, getting beat up or whatever. And when I try to do it publicly, here's, exactly. here's the thing we all know, a defense mechanism kick in and publicly I don't want to lose oh, on yeah. either side. Oh, yeah. And then, then I begin, pride comes in. And then pride comes yeah. in. Yeah. And I get more and more outraged. One, why'd you not just talk to me about this? Mm-hmm. Why'd you bring this up? And then there are people from the outside that also jump in that reaffirm my position mm-hmm. and or reaffirm your position. Mm-hmm. And it all just goes up, up, and up. So I do I do think fear plays a big part in it. So Yeah, I think too fear fear gets stored up in our bodies. And mm. what I mean is it's a, it, it, it is a part of – it's not an external thing. We think of it as an external thing of um, there are fearful things that make me fearful, right? So there's danger, and that makes me fearful. Because I've had this conversation with people before about – just last night I was talking to somebody about um, COVID and all of this, and they were, they were talking about, you know – the school's response and church response and how should we handle things and they said and I know I need to be afraid like I need to make smart choices and I said well I think it's important to to to, to differentiate between wisdom and fear oh yeah um because you should be wise and when someone tells you hey there's wisdom that you know you know you should lock your doors at night if that's wisdom right if that's wisdom then you should do that or if you or should if wear a mask, mask is wisdom. because that's wisdom you you should wear the mask but if 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 your sole reason is fear mm. that's something that gets stored up in your body and 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 you see it in some of the ways you guys have already talked about of people it's almost an automatic response i you know i think that's why it's so subconscious i think you're totally right on the reasons that we do it i feel like i got to defend something or i feel like i got to speak truth because my side's going to lose but it's almost subconscious on that level i think for most people it's just automatic of i got to go at these people and so because it's automatic i don't even realize oh that's how i'm responding and i see this a lot with parents um we don't realize we're parenting from fear and we are right that i'm that i'm i'm so angry at this child and some of the most guilt i've ever felt as a parent i'm sure you guys maybe can relate or can't of is the sometimes the anger I feel towards my own child of yeah. what well, and then I go why do I feel so much anger towards this person that I love and when I get to the root of it, it's fear yep. Yep. that has caused it and yeah. I don't want to acknowledge that it's fear and often fear comes from this desire to control mm-hmm. um, and I go into every situation and every person going if you just be the way that I want you to be then everything would be okay. And so the fear that comes when someone believes something different than me mm-hmm. comes down to, I don't even know that people even think they're coming out to save the soul of America or save save this. It's that you're someone I care about, and it kind of makes me a little afraid that we don't agree on this. There's a fear yeah. 
I, I just don't like that idea that you and I, because oh. I convinced myself this was a moral thing, and mm-hmm. you, that well, may mean you're a thing in you that I don't know, and right. it's like now I've got I've got this person that I thought I knew, and now maybe I don't, and you're maybe you're an enemy. Yes, you and know? and I think the less control we've had, I think the reason you're seeing it more in this COVID season is a lot of us feel like we've lost control over once again. We think our lives, but it's just the circumstances in our lives. We feel like we have, right? I can't go to the places I used to, and it just makes me angry. And the reason I'm angry is I'm afraid. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid of of what my life will be like without, and I, and I know this seems silly to equate it, but for some of us, this is what we feel, without softball. Without taking my kids to solve, there's a fear of well, what without, if I don't, without school the way I used to without go. school or the without way my I used kid to. getting to have a graduation yep. or my kid right. getting to go to prom that somehow they're going to remember that 40 years from now they will remember it it won't matter right yeah that, it, that's right and I've got a senior in my home and sh- and that's part of the we we've dealt with this this whole thing of what's that going to be like if she doesn't get her senior year because that's the thing that everybody looks for it as this is going to be the best year of your whole high school career and I, I finally told her one day I said I said sweetheart this is going to be a story that you tell your children and grandchildren sure. you're living through history yeah right that's now, right and you're going to talk about the pandemic of 2020 I said but here's what you're really going to tell them about you're going to tell them what you how you responded yep. right and you're not going to talk about these these other things i said i know they feel huge to you right now and i and we need to mourn those with you and, yeah. and i'm so sorry that it didn't go the way you w- w- maybe wanted it to but when you look back you're going to tell a story and i want you to tell a good story right that's right and i was really proud of her because um getting ready to start school virtually she came to us the other day and she said you know i've been talking to some of my friends and and we think we've got a plan for us to do some small group gatherings, even going to school in small groups together. If, Good. We, if you guys will allow us to do that and we can make that work. And she said, and then we've got some other things we're planning. She said, I think we're going to – she said, my, my goal is I want to make the most out of this. And I yep. said, you got the right attitude. That's mm-hmm. exactly how you approach that thing, not mm-hmm. with fear, right? but with my response to that and making the most out of it. And I think, I think that's the part where – the fear does get stored up in your body yes. of, so that makes me afraid. I'm afraid for my kid, mm-hmm. and now I might not have my job, mm-hmm. and that gets me a little afraid. Mm-hmm. And I do have these kind of, I have started to view my faith through my politics, so what I've done is I've made political issues deeply moral issues. And almost faith issues. Faith they issues, feel sure. Like they mm-hmm. all feel tied together. And so when now when someone does this thing that I feel like I can control, that I can sway you, which once again, I go back to parenting because this, this is the world I'm very much in. I mean, I know yeah. you're always a parent. I'm in very hands-on every moment as a correctional kind of. Yeah. There's this feeling of if I just say that a little longer, if I talk a little longer <laughs> a little and louder. say it a different or talk a little <laughs> louder or put a different kind of punishment on yeah. it or a different kind of thing, it'll sink in and mm. they'll get it and they'll know that I'm right. When in the end, the way that they'll know that I'm right most often is, whether they ever know I'm right is, I want them to know I love them mm. and I want them, them to know that I'm here for them. I want to model for them what Jesus would do for them so that they're drawn to his love. And if I do that for my children, I should do that for the people I interact with. Mm-hmm. And there's got to be some way, and I think that's the reason we don't mourn things. Fear causes me not to mourn it. Because if I mourn that I lost my graduation, I'm giving up control. Which is, often that's part of like the five stages of grief, too. I have to give up. This person is gone. I can't bring them back. I can't Mm. bring my life back. And And so much of what I had planned, it's gone. Right. The thoughts I had about what the future would look like, that's gone. And it's scary to to admit that, that and loss of control. We have this thought of those things that I am mourning, which are all in the future, I really lost them. Truth is, they weren't ever there. You were never mm. promised those things. Well, True. I was not only promised them, they, they weren't they real. They didn't exist. Right. They were they a dream in they, my head. They weren't real. Yes. Mm. But they felt real to me because yeah. I had put a lot into them. Mm-hmm. And And so when they're gone, it feels like I lost something real. I never had anything that yes. was lost there. Yeah. But, you know. Well, a lot of times, the hardest part of mourning, and I'm, I'm speaking on this from experience, right. is mourning what you thought you were going to have. Mourning something mm. you, you never saw. You know, yep. we, we mourned a child, my yeah. wife mm-hmm. and I. And I always told people when we went through that, I said, it's not so much of what we lost. 
it was the imagination of what we thought was about to happen yep. right. and what this child, w- who he was going to be. And, and mm-hmm. that, that's, that's still with me every single day. Yep. I, I think about, I, I had a picture in my mind, mm-hmm. an imagination of being a dad to this son. And, and that just never materialized. And so that's a ri- – and it's, it's like trying to mourn something that you, you just right. grasp for a, a vapor. You know, when you mourn a person that you had with you. At least you, you had something. You mourn the past. That's right. This sure. is, these are the memories, and those are good, but I mourn not having them anymore. When you mourn something that you never had. Right. It's really difficult. Well, and I, think, I can imagine, yeah. And I think that's a, a good illustration, too, for what we're talking about here of this future reality that, like you said, we don't we don't have. Mm-hmm. And I may – like, so like a graduation that I never – I don't know what that's like, and I never – and I dreamed of that. Or, you know, people are getting married, and the wedding's not going to look the way that you thought it was mm-hmm. or whatever. And, yeah. and Or certainly just your children growing up and all those things. There's fear that you have, and you have no way – you're not releasing it and then you release it on people and you're not changing anything. And I think that's why so much of what we're talking about these days. And I know we're going to be talking about even more going forward is kind of the power dynamics in our culture. Those who historically have had power, and this is the part we have to just deal with. We, we are afraid of losing that. Mm -hmm. And there's a fear in those who, historically have not had power whether it be people of color or people who are uh, poor or in poverty who've never had it there's a fear associated along with that too it's not of something that they it's also of something they've never had this feeling of the reality that they live in and often the power dynamics of grasping for control between the two of us uh, it it it, do, it produces nothing but outrage when if people would begin to um, go go forth going hey let me let me move towards you in love like jesus would in a humble nature in a in a movement like this things would change but as long as i'm moving out of fear well fear is always going to be grasping for something and holding on to something love is always open-handed yeah love is always coming at me and i may have things in my hand but I don't grasp them, whether right. it's a kid oh, yeah. or it's a marriage or anything. It's open-handed. I, I hold it, and it's precious to me. And the tighter I squeeze it, I lose something. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's true. Mm-hmm. But fear makes me want to close my hands, mm-hmm. hold on to money, hold on to people, hold on to things, hold on to position, hold on to what I have, hold on to stuff people tell me I have that I didn't even realize I had. That's why people say, you didn't know you had it until you lost it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then I grieve it, and I go, oh, I didn't even know I had that, but Mm -hmm. I should have held on tighter. Mm -hmm. You know, no, it it wasn't that. (laughs) That's not it. Because Mm -hmm. love has to be open-handed. Yes. Yes. It has to be open-handed in in everything. It's, It's why it says perfect love. If I could really live, and it's talking about God's love. That's what John's describing. If I could live in the fact of what we try to say to people around here all the time, no matter where you are, God really is for you. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have negative thoughts about you. He's totally committed to your good and your best. The reason we often don't experience it is not because he isn't wanting it for us or trying to do his part in it, but because fear keeps us from living in that. I mean, we've Mm -hmm. been talking about moving into the kingdom. We've talked about over the last several weeks. It, It really is as simple as if I could live in the fact that God is for me, there isn't anything happening in this world that's mm-hmm. going to change that. Mm-hmm. There isn't anything going to happen to me or to Jason or other people I love and care about, anything that goes on in this world that somehow can impact that. Therefore, I should be able to engage with everything without being afraid, including somebody who wanted to hurt me. Well, and without, mm-hmm. without, without anger being my motivation. Right. Um, mm-hmm. because, and which I think is hard for many of us, especially with all the things – going on in the world. I remember reading a, it was for a different message, but I was reading this um, article that was written by a psychologist who actually works with social justice movements. And he talked about how anger is a powerful spark. And he said uh, that often brings about change because there's a wrong that's committed. Anger is a natural response to that wrong of that shouldn't happen. That's not the way it is. But he said, you have to quickly move past that because he said, anger is a fuel that burns too hot for a lifetime that it will burn you up before that you, that that social act he said so for social activists you can't live in that anger right the anger is a good spark that gets you moving in the right direction but so many of us who have lived in anger for so long 
what we what we, you end up finding out is, man, I burned me up and I burned some people that I loved up, or I burned down the whole organization because I was just moving in anger, and anger can't be the primary. It's why Jesus Jesus talks about, hey, you got to remove your contempt for other people. You've got to just remove that. That that can't be your way of operating in the world. And most of us. When I don't remember, as you said earlier, that it's uh, it's powers and principalities. If I get to, people are never my enemy. That's right. People are never the enemy. There might be something that is oppressing them. I remember hearing um, a, a quote from uh, Dr. King, and I'm not going to say it correctly, but because uh, I can't say it exact, I don't remember exactly how he said it. But he would often lead in his marches before he would go, and he says, "As we pray for one another, we must also pray." He said, "You can't march in this if you're not willing to pray for the white brothers and sisters who are going to be on the opposite side of this." He said, "Because the system of oppression isn't just oppressing us; it's oppressing them." Mm. He said, "Because it is keeping them held in hatred and racism, yes. and and that's the nature of it. If it the is. person on the other side who holds this <laughs> despicable belief mm-hmm. is not." the enemy the system that is behind it and we believe the evil force that is behind it uh that is the enemy in in which we we fight against and and Mm. so anger doesn't have to be my motivation at that point Mm. but it's hard for it not to because it's natural yeah all right uh i pulled uh, a scripture that i wanted to read and then there's a question behind that uh scripture that I think can help us talk a little more about what we've been dealing with the past two weeks. Um, it's it's something Paul wrote in First Corinthians chapter nine. I'll just read it and then we'll uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. He says, "Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law." I lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. I don't ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. So when I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness because I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. He's describing this really others-focused kind of life. Mm-hmm. How does that play into or uh, tie into this idea of us taking the plank out of our eye instead of constantly pointing out the specks in others um, mm-hmm. the way he describes that there? I, yeah. I think when the focus is on other people, I begin to when – the, when the focus is on – I have problems with this person, therefore they are the problem. (laughs) Um, It immediately removes the thought that I should serve them, Mm -hmm. that I should help them, Mm -hmm. that I should think of something in my behavior that should change because, Mm -hmm. of course, they're the problem. Mm -hmm. Why should I change when they're the problem? Yes. I was being so reasonable and they're being so unreasonable. Why should I change? But when I begin to, in every situation interacting with a person to say, uh, what is it about this situation that I, how, how can I look at them as a way that I could serve them? How can I listen better? How mm-hmm. can I say, hey, maybe I didn't understand what you were saying. Mm-hmm. Help, me, help me understand what you're saying. Instead of letting my anger rise, I look for a way to help us engage, to bridge the gap. Yeah. Um, which would have been very easy for Paul to walk into any of these situations that he described. I just imagine every single one of those groups of people that he walks into, it would have been so easy for him to just look at what they're getting wrong because each of those groups that he describes in that passage, they were missing a part of the kingdom. Yeah, everything was a something. little off. There yeah. was something off, and he said, and, and he's, his approach could have been, that, let me show you where you're off. Right. Let me fix this. And he said, no, I became like them right. in order to show them. That's a that's a whole nother approach. It is. That's that's taking the plank. I see it as I completely take the plank out. Yeah. You know. And I I don't I don't walk in to say here's your problem. It's it's I lay down my my rights and right. engage. I look if there's something that's going to keep us from engaging yes. by changing me. Now that doesn't mean I change my values. Paul no. never became a Jew. That's right. He behaved as a Jew. Now, he was already a Jew <laughs> yeah. ethnically. He never became a, a Gentile. Gentile yeah. uh, he never became a person that didn't love the law of God. But yeah. 
<laughs> you know, all of those things. He, he laid it aside. He laid it. He just said, that doesn't matter in this yes. instance. You matter. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that's the way I would see that. Well, and I think, you know, just looking at that particular verse, everything he's doing is for the sake of winning people to Christ. Mm-hmm. And I just, I think that's the difference. I think the difference, so if I if I go into a situation and I'm a, I'm a Republican and I see someone on the other side, so I see a Democrat, before I go in and I look at all the things I think are wrong and I've convinced myself that they are somehow anti-Jesus because they're anti-me, mm. they're anti-what I believe, which is what all of us do. I remember hearing Scott McKnight, who's a um, theologian and professor uh, in Chicago, I think, is yeah. correct. he's at Northwestern, and he uh, he would have students take an exam at the beginning of every class thing where he would ask them like their personal beliefs and philosophies, political, all different kinds of stuff down on a sheet of paper. And then he would do a differently worded one about what Jesus thoughts were on certain things. And he said, (laughs) remarkably, they were 98% the same that every group of people, their beliefs and what they believe Jesus believed were the same. And he would use that to say, this is how you read the Bible. So you begin with an assumption of, well, Jesus already thinks what I think because I couldn't be wrong. Mm. I couldn't be wrong. And so if I go into a situation, which you're talking about the situation, Paul goes into a Gentile setting, and he's been a Jew and a hardcore religious Jew as well Mm -hmm. before this of of totally loving the law and being perfect under the law. His natural response, which is in fact why the Jews didn't associate with the Gentiles, everything about what they did from the food to they ate to what they wore was offensive. It was Mm -hmm. deeply offensive. I remember having a professor explain that when Peter had to go into Cornelius' Cornelius house and eat his food, he said, him sitting down to eat a pig, eating, because we all joke about, oh, well, Peter finally got to eat bacon. (laughs) Bacon's the greatest thing. To Peter, it would be. I bet he choked on it. Well, it said, oh, I, bet, I bet he choked. It would have been. It was. It would be the same as if you went to another country and had to eat bat or dog mm-hmm. or something like that. Well, I remember I went to a country and there was there was a family in our church at the time that was from that country. And when I came back, I told them I had been offered this and I did eat it. <laughs> uh, it guinea pig. Right. Now, guinea pig is a pet here. <laughs> yeah. It's right. It's a pet. But they they don't. And they, they have big. They pigs. only eat it. On special occasions, but when we came, they gave it to us, and they only ate vegetables, mm. not because they were they wanted us to have a well, delicacy. So, an so for thing. me to not eat it would have not made sense. Yes. Right. But it wasn't easy for me to eat because I have cultural thoughts in my head about the it's a grown up rat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's such a really big rat that some people like to play with as pets. Yes. And uh, so and so for Paul, it's not just a oh, I think this is wrong. There's a mm-hmm. physical. Com- I mean, it's just it's revolting on some level mm-hmm. to be in these environments. I mean, it's why when you see in a lot of these letters, a lot of it's over what they're eating. Oh yeah. And it's not just it's not just a matter of they would they would use the argument like we use in a lot of political arguments of you know those meat they were sacrificed to idols. But a lot of it is. That's just disgusting that they're bringing that to our table. I've never had that experience before. And so they're having these arguments because it's these totally different cultures. And so Paul goes, when I go in those environments, my goal is not to make the Jews pig eaters, bacon eaters. My goal is not to come in and make the Gentiles stop eating bacon. My goal is to get them to Christ. And there are certain issues that you believe politically and I believe politically that we might have to admit are not are not Jesus centric issues that I have to I have to come mm-hmm. in and my job is to get all the Democrats to come on my side or all the Republicans to come on my side. My goal is to say, is there common ground that, hey, you know what? We both value human life. I had this conversation with or, or, or I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I was just gonna I was just gonna make the uh, example and then I'll be done of of both parties, I find this very interesting. Both parties think on, from their point of view, they're for the underdog and the little guy. Absolutely. It's just from a different perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Tends to be uh, conservatives. Are all, uh, we're for small business owners, and, and middle-class people are just trying to make it. Other side tends to take a different approach to that kind of thing. But both sides says we love the under. So what if both sides came together and said, <laughs> hey, we both value human life, and we both want to give everyone a good shot at having a good life Instead of coming in and going, you're despicable, you hate poor people. Mm-hmm. Or coming in and go, you don't, you don't honor the working man, which is probably not true on either side of the argument. Yeah, no, so yeah. anyway, I think that, that's what yep. I heard when you were talking about yep. that. It, 
I had, uh, uh, you know, one of the conversations that has come out of the first two weeks has been this idea of politics. People are in a political system. Everything is political. And the, the conversation I've had in multiple, multiple times over the last two weeks in different electronic communication with people is, are you saying to be a follower of Christ, I shouldn't care about who I vote for mm -hmm. and that I can't be passionate about certain issues and let people know what I think? And I said to them, I didn't say th in these words because it wasn't necessary for me to quote the scripture, but to give the idea of it. I said what you said. Paul went into every situation knowing I represent Jesus. Mm -hmm. And my highest value is to represent Jesus. And the most important thing for every person on the planet is to relate their life to God through Jesus. So anything, even if it really matters to me, like not eating pork, Mm -hmm. that might get in the way of me offending somebody and them not m moving toward Jesus, mm. well, I guess I'm going to have some bacon. Mm -hmm. Right. And if it got to the point that other people said, hey, man, I heard you ate bacon, I go, well, yeah, I was trying to love the person, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to eat bacon with you. Yeah. I, right. you know, I, I don't think you have to eat bacon. This isn't <laughs> an issue for me. And so what I s have tried to say to people is you can have your opinions but when they become too big, mm. when they become so important, and the person actually said, I don't think I've lost any friends over it. It's not about you no. losing in it's not about you losing friends. It's about you losing potential influence mm -hmm. with people who are watching in this public arena and they think from watching your behavior, the most important thing that's gonna happen on this planet is an election in November. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I don't think you really believe that, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't be wrong in saying that your behavior and That's your right. talk often sounds that way. Mm -hmm. We have to re realize I represent Jesus, so my talk needs to be that that's not even close to the truth. We, mm -hmm. I've voted in a bunch of elections, and frankly, it hasn't. Everything's pretty, maybe, you know, it just keeps going downhill, it appears. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. It just hasn't changed all that it, much. It, it honestly hasn't yeah. changed that much one or the other, and I've seen people on both sides. Well, in every election cycle, what we hear from the, the, the losing side is the country's going to collapse because this happens. It never really it does. It never really collapses. On either side. On either side. Yeah. So, I just, that's what I would want people to see is the way I would see this in a political scope is, Yes, you should vote. It's okay with me if you care about it. It has to be kept in its slot. It's like mm -hmm. me. I really care about baseball, but baseball, most people would say, you shouldn't care about baseball more than you care about our country. <laughs> well, maybe I do, maybe I don't. <laughs> Some, you know, most days I do. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's certainly everybody would say you shouldn't care about baseball more than you care about Jesus yeah. and the life that's to come. But if I act like that that's a problem yeah that's well, a problem or if you give the perception in the way that you act that that's Th what that you is what really matters yeah. is who you root for in baseball or football mm -hmm. or basketball or yeah. whatever any of those kind yeah. of not, that all of us would admit this doesn't mm -hmm. this isn't going to solve everything something i realize and you, nathan you made me think of this this idea of uh, my political ideas always aligning what i think are always lined up with jesus sure um I'll say something that my 20-year-old self would have been horrified to hear me say. Oh, okay. But part of what I've come to realize in myself is when I, my spiritual growth towards becoming more like Jesus has been, uh, has been shown to me in the ways that I have changed and shifted in my thinking. Because if I never did shift, and if I, if, if I drew the line at 20, and this is the way God is, and this is the way what Jesus thinks on every issue, and I never moved, that wasn't Jesus. That was me. <laughs> yes. You know, and the fact that I have shifted and changed, I do not think the way I thought at 20 or at 30 or at even 40, mm -hmm. now I'm for, in my 40s, mm -hmm. um, to me is an in indicator that I am becoming like Christ more and more. At least that's what I'm hoping. And to, to do the opposite would be me going away from him. Yeah, and I think I think that right there was go was something similar to what I was going to say, or at least he's into it. Of when you said the thing about someone saying, "Well, I haven't lost any friends," and and it's not even that the the point is even about necessarily your friends. There's a danger to you when you begin to believe every political idea or every 
every issue is suddenly becomes Jesus is on my side. What does happen is, as I said about fear getting stored up in your body, your character begins to get formed into a person who begins to believe my allegiance is mostly to this country or to my political beliefs or to my opinions over Jesus. You know, you said in the one of the things that was most thought provoking for me on Sunday was the part where you had everyone close their eyes and you said, Can you see the body of Christ? Mm-hmm. And you talked about, you know, there are more believers yeah. outside of our That's country. My part, so yeah, and we right. share a deeper bond with these mm-hmm. people and for so many of us, that's hard to hear. Yeah. That's hard to hear, but it's so true. I, I had read something that day. I was backstage, and so I'd already heard the message, so I do what everybody does. I'm sitting on my phone the, the second uh, mm-hmm. second sermon. I'm sitting back there right about the time you are, and I'm, I'm scrolling on Twitter, and I saw a, a thing from a pastor who was putting all these statistics out about the average um, American. He had a whole bunch. I'm not going to go say them all, but the, what, what he got down to was the average American, uh, the average Christian in the world is a 22-year-old brown female, mm. um, and that the average, and this was just strange to me, I never heard this before, that the average life, the median life expectancy or something of, not life expectancy, median age of the population in the world is 28, wow. that that most people are 28, and so he said most, most believers around the world are not... Um, can't think of the word he used, but it was something along the lines of not uncomfortable with the idea of having to be go to jail for their faith, or it's not foreign to them to have to go to jail for their faith, mm-hmm. or to, to, to be beaten for their faith, or to lose family members for their faith, and to lose that. And so we often talk about, well, I might lose friends for my political beliefs, <laughs> and I might lose... Well, and, I, and the interesting thing to me is, I do know people in this season that have decided they won't be friends with people anymore because of a political stance. Wow. Uh, we all know people. And even some I agree with them on. There are political yeah. stances mm-hmm. that I hear mm-hmm. that yeah. I hope we can get changed in our country. And people go, I tried to have that conversation. It lasted about 20 minutes. And at the end of 20 minutes, I just go, we're done. Mm. And Ugh. people I know that have ended 10, 15, 20-year friendships. Yeah. And – I think they're on the side. The issue, I think, the side they're on with the issue, I think it's God's side. I really do mm-hmm. believe that. Mm-hmm. The way they are reacting to it has canceled what they were standing for. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're not on the side of people, you, you're you not on God's side anymore. No, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yes. I know I know people who are very close to me right now. I was having a conversation with someone last night who their family is in turmoil over this of yeah. – Children who won't speak to parents and parents who won't speak to children over. Now, once again, they don't see it as a political issue, but because I know where both of them stand politically, I know this is a political issue for you, and you think it's something else, but it's not. And the way that that ends up coming about. And so what I mean is, if I begin to believe that of, well, God wants me to cut these relationships off for this sake, then when then then ultimately I have moved my politics in front of, what my faith is, and I do think we begin to believe this this American Christian idea of it, God is most invested in what is happening right here instead of, and I think believers around the world who, once again, average age is 22, a woman, a brown woman who is in, in her 20s who might lose her family over this, who might go to jail, and not over their political beliefs, where they stand with Jesus would go, what are y'all even, I don't, I think it would, I think our version of Christianity would be so foreign to the world and to the history of Christianity that they would go. I, uh, there's a a person I dearly love in Haiti who was, it has, before COVID, planned to be in the United States Mm -hmm. in the fall, and, uh, they wanted to come to Community Christian. They love Community Christian. We've helped their community a lot. And a person who we're mutual friends said, wanted to know, they said, can this person come to Community Christian? I said, yes, they are more than welcome. You and I have to prepare them that what they expect is going to happen at church yeah. is not going to happen at Community Christian because their view of what Christians do with each other is not what any christian in the united states thinks happens at church yeah Mm -hmm. never does and they're going to be sorely disappointed if we do not prepare them for it yes we just need to prepare them for it Mm -hmm. and i think and i think we also have to realize there are things we can learn from them and we should be Mm -hmm. learning from them 
about our faith. And so often I hear, once again, you talk about places like Haiti where we've been to help people, and the amount of people who think, you know, if we could just get in there and get their government to be more, you know, where they could, their, their votes really mattered and their elections really mattered, that would fix everything. And I think, I look at these churches and I go, God, if we could learn from the, their discipleship and the way they're loving one another and serving one another, maybe we could fix other things well, going on in our country. I'll say this. One of the things I love about going to Haiti is they are very passionate about their politics. And uh, we ha- I have been there during a the political season where there were actually in Port-au-Prince riots, sort of. Our bus mm-hmm. got us sort of in a riot. And some people, it wasn't that big a deal. Somebody mooned us and I go, <laughs> that ain't the first time I've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, All right. I, I have mooned a person well, before, so it wasn't, it wasn't a big time for me. True confessions for me. Uh, it right. wasn't a big deal, and it didn't really bother me that much. Uh, and But they're very passionate. They do not wait on the government, even when it's somebody they voted for to fix anything. Mm-hmm. They vote on it. They're passionate about it, and then they say, how are we going to work this out? How are we going to get about fixing this? And eventually their country, in the parts of the country where it's further away, when you get out in the rural areas where they are passionate too, they're passionate. I heard an argument over really a really heated argument between two guys I knew loved each other. And at the end of it, they started working on a solution, though they disagreed politically. Wow. Imagine that. <laughs> Yes, because if if I get to a place where I realize, you know what Jesus cares about? Jesus cares about this problem. Yes. Jesus mm-hmm. cares about these people. Yes. Then I can enter in not with, and, and I would then also assume Jesus may have a different idea than me. I can't assume that the idea I bring to the table must be, which that's just good general team working anything. I cannot stand when you go into a, a, a meeting or any of this, and we have this in all of our meetings where I come in and I believe, well, my idea has to be the right idea, and I'm unwilling to work. Any collaboration, we know this because we all it work in those down. meetings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to collaborate with one another, and you have to be willing to give and take and learn. Maybe Jesus is going to work through the community of believers mm-hmm. to figure out. It's not, it's not you and Jesus figuring it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had somebody on Sunday you were talking about the communion part. Um, not just one person. I had a couple of people tell me, by the time you were done, I wasn't sure if I should take communion or not. They mm-hmm. said it oh, laughingly. Yeah. I said, oh, that's what I was hoping for. Yeah, exactly. That's right. I said, you, and you I said, pause. we should always pause and always. feel like, man, I'm not sure I should take this. Instead of what many of us have done, we take it without thinking mm-hmm. uh, and assume, oh, of course I should take this. Mm-hmm. Grace cover me. Yeah, Grace, Grace has got it, and then I act like it's not a big deal. I should be thinking about Really, how am I dealing with people? Because yes. people mm-hmm. are, the only way I know I love God is, do I love the people around me? Mm-hmm. Am I willing to work with the people that are around me? Mm-hmm. Enemies, family, friends, neighbors, yeah, mm-hmm. all of those things. All right. That's enough. Unless y'all got something else to I, say. I'm good. I'm going I'm I'm to cut good. it right there. All right. Week three this week. week Don't miss three, it. Yeah. Jason's up this week. I am up, and uh, I just, I'm up. That's yeah, it. it'll be good. It will be good. It's going to be good. I Come hope. ready. Yes. So we'll see y'all then. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye.